No one will be that eternal priestly bride, but she who has made herself ready. For the battle is raging. Hello, and welcome back to podcast number six on the eternal unveiling. Well, I hope you've been studying, and I hope you've been ready for this third feast I promised to share with you on this podcast. And now we come to the theme of this whole writing, and it is the third feast and its fulfillment on earth. And let's take a look at Matthew 24, 32, and 33. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Beloved, the branches are indeed putting forth the buds. And what comes next? The fruit. Well, the groaning creation, which we're going to do in our next series, uh, has travailed until now, groaning for the manifestations of the sons of God, the foliar corn, the figs, the precious fruit of the earth. This is the final harvest that the Father had in mind from the very first breath of creation. He has tilled and watered it, and He has sent watchmen to guard it, and He has sent laborers to this third uh, fullness of time. And this is what James 5, 7 tells us. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Well, the early rain brought forth the grain harvest at Pentecost, and it was the time of power and teaching. But that which the latter rain nourished is now coming to fullness. That teaching that we've received for 2,000 years is now bringing a full harvest a bride made ready. So let's briefly discuss the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the ingathering of the fruit harvest. It had several other names, such as the Festival of Tents, the Feast of Ingathering, the Festival of Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, the term ingathering also means fullness. So we see how um, this third feast aligns with fullness that the very word in gathering of this fruit harvest also means fullness. Uh, The seven days of living in tents or booths was to signify that God was now tabernacling with his people and their dependence now shifting from Egypt to God. And he was to be their tent of protection and all the fruits were now fully gathered in. As a matter of fact, the word tabernacle means tent of meetings. And one commentary that I read said it was to portray the coming of the presence of God. Wow. You know, I I couldn't have said it better. Because the third fullness is the coming of the presence of God to dwell in His bride and to be manifested to all mankind for their last call to come in and be one with their Creator. I would like to refer to a vision given by Brother William Branham, a personal friend of mine, worked with him for many years, and was very close to him, and um, set up uh, some of his meetings. And here was the dream that Brother Branham had. Now he, William Branham, was standing high in the air, not outside, but rather he seemed to be inside some kind of structure, Above him stretched a domed ceiling, like that of a cathedral or a gigantic tent. Bill had never seen before such a huge canopy. Below him, thousands of people sat in rows facing a platform at one end of the tent. Hundreds of people were kneeling in front of this platform, weeping softly and worshiping Jesus Christ. Apparently, this was an 
an evangelistic meeting, and the preacher had just made an altar call. Bill said, now that's more like it. And a kindly-looking gentleman walked up to the pulpit and said in a soothing voice, while Brother Branham is resting, let's form the prayer line. Everyone with a prayer card, line up over here on my right. Bill was facing the same direction as the crowd, that is, toward the pulpit on the platform. And from his vantage point above the meeting, he watched the people with prayer cards stand and move to their left, forming a line that continued all the way to the back of the tent and on outside. This was very different from his current meetings. And not only were there far more people in line than usual, the whole structure of the prayer line was different. In front of the prayer line hung a canvas curtain blocking the view of the platform from those people standing on the floor. And things were different up on the platform, too. Between the prayer line and the pulpit stood a rectangular building about 12 feet wide by 20 feet long with a door on each end. A woman holding a notebook stood by the door facing the prayer line. Another woman stood by the door near the pulpit. Puzzled by all this, Bill looked around for the angel of the Lord so he could ask him to explain. The angel was standing in the air beside him, off to his right. Above the angel swirled that light, throwing off licks of flame, roaring like the pulsating sound of a whirlwind. Then something happened that Bill had never seen before. The pillar of fire left the angel of the Lord and glided down through the auditorium until it came to that small building on the platform. For a moment, the light hovered above that little building. Then it settled straight down through the roof into the room below. As soon as the pillar of fire was hidden from sight, the angel of the Lord said to William Branham, I'll meet you in there. This is the third pool of your ministry. Now the prayer line moved. The first patient in line was a woman on an ambulance stretcher. Two men carried her through the curtain, up the steps, and across the platform to that little building. The woman who was standing by the door nearest to the prayer line wrote down the sick woman's name and affliction in a notebook. Then the two men carried the stretcher into the little room. The crowd hushed as everyone focused their attention on the rectangular building standing on the platform. Suddenly, the door nearest the pulpit opened, and out came the woman, pushing her stretcher in front of her and praising the Lord very loudly as she shouted. And the dark-haired woman who was standing by the back door of the little building seemed to be a reporter, and she said, What happened in there? The woman said, I don't know what happened. The woman answered, I was... Uh, paralyzed for 20 years and now look at me I feel like I was never crippled the second person in the prayer line was a man on crutches he hobbled into the little room but soon he leaped out the back door shouting holding his crutches high in the air and the woman said what happened in there the man said I don't know but look I can walk Bill said to the angel of the Lord I don't understand what is going on in that little room The angel replied, Did not our Lord say, When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Yes, That is what our Lord told us to do. I will meet you in that room. This is the third pool. It will be a public show. And to that, William Branham said, I understand. The angel carried him down into that room and told him what to do for the third time. Then the angel told him a secret, referring to that conversation. Bill said, friends, when I leave this world, That secret will still be in my bosom, but mark my words, you watch what is going to take place next. Well, here we are. You and I are part of that fulfillment. William Branham died in 1965, I believe it was. And now here we are, going into the time period where we're going to tabernacle with him, and he's going to tabernacle with us, and in our intimacy time with him he's going to transform us 
into what he desired us to be when we were in the garden. I believe that Brother Branham was seeing the last and greatest event in the history of this present age, and it would not start in the halls of the public eye. It would begin in the personal time of deep, intense surrender to the Lord in our own prayer closet. It will reach the attention of the media and the world, but that is not what actually would begin it. It is that which has been the desire of both the bridegroom and the bride. This tent of meetings referred to in the Old Testament where Moses met with God now belongs to you and I if we're pressing in to be the bride. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, Israel was to go out and live in booths. This, of course, is speaking of their having left Egypt and the descent into the wilderness. This was to be a joyful event. They were leaving a type of security as typed by Egypt and going into a desert that they could not possibly survive in without the hand of God. They would be living in makeshift dwellings, but the presence of God would be with them, and it would be a time of great miracles and testing all at the same time. Are you getting the picture? See, it is here that God would part the Red Sea. It is here that Israel would walk across on dry land. Israel would experience this pillar of fire for the first time. It would stand between them and the enemy. It would go before them and lead the way. It was also in this time that God would give His law, speak audibly to the people, feed them with supernatural provision, and bring water out of the rock. This is where we're going now. This time is upon us. It would be advantageous to read the story again of Israel going to the desert. We will be reintroduced to this pillar of fire, as Brother Branham had mentioned in his vision. We will hear God's voice. We will see His provision and protection like never before. Our shoes will not wear out. Our food supply will be His to give to His children. It will be also a time of great testing, and many will want to go back to Egypt. The ground will open up many and swallow them in their rebellion, but something supernatural is going to take place in that tent of meetings, and man will not orchestrate it. God himself will meet with you and me, making us whole and making us one with him. Ezekiel talked about the river or flood that would come out of the tabernacle and get deeper and deeper and bring life wherever it flowed. And it went all the way to the Dead Sea, it says in Ezekiel, and brought life to the Dead Sea. And I believe when God meets with us in this final Feast of Tabernacles, His heart is going to burst open from the conjoined heart of the Father with heaven, the heavenly saints and earth and its bride, overcomers. And there will be torrents of water rushing out of the Holy of Holies into this world to sweep a people into a final conclusion of time. And it will cleanse and make whole all as they enter into the Holy of Holies, those who will co- go in to intimacy. And this is our hour. This will be the first place that this river will flow as it comes out from the Holy of Holies. It will flow into the bride, the intimacy time with the Lord in unity. Those who are meeting in that place will make one last push and the torrents of water and glory will be born. And as this happens, those closest to the Father will be among the first to receive the fullness of the last feast. It will clean up their sin, their confusion and misconceptions. It will also bring with it a restoration of all things that have been lost to the church. The miraculous will be among these great events. Oh, but we haven't seen anything yet. And as is expected, this flow will continue into the holy place, clean it up, take all the corruption out of this place, where it will once again be sacred. From there, it will proceed to the outer court of the tabernacle, where the majority of believers dwell, not wanting to pay a price to come in deeper. But they are not in the place of intimacy, and they are standing back in a comfort zone. But this flood's going to take them over, and they'll have to make a decision. They're afraid of the cost of the inner chambers. They walk in a lot of fear and love the world. 
But as the flow reaches this court, many will be swept away and lost forever. Others will ha have a new understanding and, and embrace holiness, not as an option, but as a necessity. Uh, it's that factor uh, of reaching holiness uh, in the realms of the Spirit will be key. Then even the lost who are in distant locations will begin to get the great thrust of water coming to the whole world. Remember, the Bible says that the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth. It will be a time of final decision, and it will be the very last harvest of the earth. There will never be another harvest. This he will do through the people chosen to participate in this feast of fullness or in gathering. They are the ones, like the little boy with the loaves and fishes. He was close enough to the master that his gifts were used to feed a multitude. And that's not all. In March of 2009, we also had some special guests at our church, Rand and Becky Miller. And um, during this time, um, at, as they came to be a part of our special uh, meetings, it was an intimate time of fellowship with a small gathering of hungry and thirsty saints. And the Lord came down on us in such a sweet way. And I could feel the oil being poured on our wounds and they were likewise being blessed. And this is how it works in true ministry. Those that um, you're working with, um, they bless one another. We bless you, you bless us, and we're pouring out. I can't even put into words all that was given during this time, but I'm going to share a revelation that God gave me to further my understanding and what He's doing in these beginning stages of the third feast. Uh, Becky shared with us a vision she had where the four-faced creature of Revelation was carefully examining her with great interest. And those eyes, all those eyes looking at her with intrigue and interest. And if you remember, they stand before the presence of God and those eyes are peering into the Father at all times. Catch this revelation. Only a few days before uh, Becky shared this, I had heard a sermon where God had told this man that these creatures with the eyes that cried, Holy, 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 were not made to do that. They wanted to stay there and examine him. And then he went on to say, Can you imagine those eyes looking at the Father? And from time to time, they're overcome with what their eyes have searched out. Then you can imagine that they are overcome and cry, Holy, Holy, Holy. And then they go back to searching again. They are addicted to the full presence of the Father. So it's back to searching again and being overcome again and crying out the only word that can describe the intensity of this, this encounter, the word holy. And in the billions of years that they have been searching it out, they have not even begun to uncover its depth. So when I heard Becky's vision, I was struck with the awesome understanding that the same eyes that continually search God out are also drawn into that which has all of the Father's attention. And those eyes also search us out. The object of His divine desire is frail mankind. How confusing it must be to those living creatures that our great God could put all His love, effort, and sacrifice into broken and weak people. How can we be the object of His affection? But we are. And when we turn to Him in love, praise, or even, even in need, our heart overflows with love toward Him, and His heart overflows with love for us. Well, I'm going to go into this again in the next podcast. I hope you're getting excited as I am. Saints of God, understand that God didn't create this awe-inspiring creation and then decide as a footnote to make man. No, He already formed the souls of men and created a universe and a body to house and service mankind. And all created order was primarily for man, the object of His desire. And the only way I can come close to understanding this is through a mother's heart, the way a mother looks at her children over and over again and never gets tired of seeing that beautiful baby. Well, God bless you. We're going to come to the end of this study in the next uh, one or two podcasts. We'll see how the Lord leads. But you stay in the Word. Be ready. Seek the heart of your bridegroom. The day is short. God bless you, friends.
This podcast has been a production of Brenda Price Ministries. Evangelist Brenda Price has more materials available on this subject, including her most recent book titled The Eternal Unveiling. It can be found at our website, along with other resources we have made available. The website can be found at brendapriceministries.weebly.com.